Michigan Research Institute uh, stand-up meeting for 28th of June, 2022. Uh, today, what we're going to talk about is what we've done over the past week and what we are planning to do over the next week. Uh, if we need any resources and if we have any roadblocks. Um, and so I have several reports from people that can't be here today. So uh, Ken Easton's sick and he is uh, digging into the scheduler. And this is the thing that will uh, decide what BB frames go to the encoder. And so what we're starting out with is a relatively simple uh, first in first out buffer or FIFO. And then over time, what happens is that policies get added to this and we do lots of really neat things with either quality of service or, or, or other functions, uh, system level functions uh, for, to serve our, um, the people using the communications resource. So there's a lot to that. It's um, oftentimes where a lot of sophisticated things happen in a communication system and ours will be no different. So scheduler work is uh, it's at the whiteboard level and we are looking to put in some hardware uh, pretty soon the hardware will start out of course being very simple uh, so there's enthusiasm there and a couple of people that are interested in that uh, let's see and Anshul might not be able to make it today and he's working on documentation for improving the uh, repository that integrates the encoder with the analog devices reference design uh, that's that's coming along so we we think we we found most of the major issues that prevented this from just being cloned and may and and built uh, by just just anyone. Um, and so those those problems have been fixed. And Anshul is going to incorporate them into his. Uh, he manages the repo for us, and then the tackle script that hooks things up in Vivado is going to be completed. Um, so that's that's coming along. And he's doing uh, lots of other really fun things and is also interested in the scheduler. Um, uh, so I'll go ahead and talk about uh, what we've been doing over the past week. We're trying very, very hard to get the encoder working over the air. Um, so we do have a over the air demo on the Pluto with the encoder. And this was shown this past weekend at Friedrichshafen ham radio show uh, by Everest. So he, he talked about and, and um, showed a screenshot or demonstration of the hardware working and that's very exciting um so so that exists and that has uh, both the firmware side and the hdl side and so this was an anchor point for us to get the zc706 working and the uh the progress there is that we are learning how to use uh direct memory access on the zc706 and there's two approaches to this one is uh, linux dma engine that's relatively high level, it has a two layer API. And also the other method is simply writing directly to the registers and configuring the uh, DMA controller, in this case, the transmit DMA controller in the reference design in order to uh, fetch uh, baseband frames from memory and then present them to the encoder, which then presents it to the DAC FIFO. And so this means several things have to happen. We have to properly size all the buses. We could just kind of leave them mismatched, but I don't think that's a good idea. So the first test that we uh, attempted to do this past week was to change the bus sizes and to use the, the DMA uh, to transmit a tone from memory. And I think we're all wanted to really have it done for today, uh, but we're really close to having that, that work. Um, what that means is that the hardware is modified and then wrapped up in Pendle Linux and then uh, put on the, the ZC706 and then use IIO to, to run a, a test, a basic test. So we're, we're hoping to get that done really soon. And then after that works, after we prove that we've got the bus size issue done and that the encoder can just drop in, then we'll drop in the encoder. And now there's probably a more sophisticated way to do this. So anybody listening, if you have a better way, uh, then, then let us know. Uh, all of this is, uh, as much as possible, is is published as it's created or as it's talked about on our Slack in the FPGA channel, uh, and we so we take corrections. Um, so what we're our approach is uh, to use IIO Live, uh, a Python script, to to run the show. Um, but we learned how to do this by writing C code that directly addressed the 
uh, registers in the DMA controller, and that that uh, that worked out okay. So a little bit lower level, I think, than we probably uh, want to end up with um, to do anything sophisticated. I think we need to have some some higher level functionality in the applications. So that's where we're at here, uh, at least in this particular um, question. Uh, I also have some some updates about the decoder. So we do have a decoder um, code base from uh, Amit Anon, and that has been picked up and we'll get some lots of additional development and that will be donated back to the repository. So I don't have a, a firm schedule for that, uh, but Amit was extremely excited to to have this happen, and it's it's how it's supposed to work in open source. So it's uh, the code base has been determined to be of value from a R and D firm, and they are working on it. And then we will uh, get a benefit uh, with an open source release uh, for the decoder. So this would be on the ground station side. So very excited about that, um, and. And looking forward to, to development on that end. On the uplink side, we've done a lot of work to firm up the uplink protocol, uh, which is opulent voice. And there's a, a tracking document that talks about it. Lots of diagrams from the uh, code base that we've worked from a narrowband uh, protocol called M17. It looks like that we're going to peel away a lot of the stuff that's done in M17 because it's all aimed and and designed for a very low bitrate codec for the 3200 bit per second codec too, which it, it is not where we want to end up in terms of voice quality. So what we've done is replaced the codec with a 16 uh, kilobit per second opus codec, and we're designing in the ability to to go even higher. So uh, some flexibility in the in an opus codec is the goal, uh, and then. Some of the some of the other functions or aspects of of that um, will be set aside, and then some other uh, sort of layers uh, will be put in. So all of this is being uh, documented in the tracking document for Opulent Voice. Uh, definitely uh, derived from from M17. So I think it's fair to say that it's a high bitrate version of of M17 is where we started from. The goal for that is to get uplink streams. Uh, working over the air to have an uplink simulator that goes directly into uh, uplink streams that will then uh, be something for the encoder to chew on and for the scheduler to deal with. So what we're talking about doing is is working on three separate pieces for an end-to-end -end demo uh, to be done as quickly as we possibly can. And to we're going to the next big show is is DEF CON in in August. So whatever is done by then, we're going to show. Whatever's not done, we will present and talk about. And that's it from from my end. I'm going to hand it over to uh, to Thomas Perry. Uh, you have the floor to talk about whatever you like, and then please pick whoever hasn't spoken yet. Okay. Hey. Um, yeah, I'm just trying to get back into things after a, a short break from the project. So um, I don't really have a lot to say, but I think that introduction was really useful for me to get an idea of what people have been working on. Um, so yeah, that's basically all I have to say. Um, uh, James? Thank you, Thomas. I'm James. For people who don't know, I'm uh, the technician working at ORI for Remote Lab South. Currently, not too much report on that end. The uh, member of the board that oversees our uh, Remote Lab South is currently out um, on a business trip. He previously left uh, California, where I believe he was uh, with you, Michelle, and was talking with a few things there and has moved on to another to the next part of his trip in Portland. But otherwise, we're not ha we don't have too much to report there. So yeah, I've, otherwise, everything going well down here at Remote Lab South. Um, Anshul, if you'd like to go next. Yeah, nothing much to report from my side also. Uh, it's basically I was involved in some documentation work, but I should be back in action tomorrow. Uh, and the plan is to pick up from where uh, Michelle is at present. Uh, we are both trying to solve the same problem. So I will uh, go through the notes that she has put in Slack and then pick it up from there. Uh, another thing is um, Everest also has developed one app for uh, testing of Pluto. So I will look at his app and the code and we'll try to port it to ZC706. 
So yeah, that's the plan. And one question from Michelle, uh, the C code that you are talking about, it's the same one from Everest that Everest has shared or it's a different one? It's, it's from the same app. Oh, um, for for operating the, you mean the C code for, for doing like DMA tests? Oh no, I, I um, no, it's just a very basic C code uh, that that uh, writes to the configuration registers for the DMA controller. So so not even as um, as fully formed as the the as Everest's firmware, um, which no. I've I've looked at and have not mastered yet. So I'm I'm still mm -hmm. ramping up to be able to appreciate everything that he's that he's done. Okay, yeah. So I'll work on that starting from tomorrow. And another thing, um, you are running this code to config DMA and everything uh, on the PS side, right? Yes, actually, yeah. I'm running some. I wrote a C program that uh, configures the the transmit DMA controller. Uh, actually, wrote it using Nano on the target. So, so very, very simple and basic, uh, you know, just to, to, to make sure that we understood how to, how to configure DMA and, and we're, we're coming right along. Um, so it's, it's getting better every day that we put our backs into it. Uh, so, so pretty simple, not straightforward. I, I, I cut and pasted the code to, to the Slack channel and then I'll, I need to do a backup in the repo and make sure that, you know, it, it, oh, it's just, very uh very simple code though so yeah it makes sense to go for simple simplistic approach in the beginning i think i totally appreciate that so yeah i just need to take that code and compile it and then run it to test it out yeah okay yeah i'll make it easy okay okay uh right so that means everything i have ready for tomorrow i can take that code and progress and i also have to look at the risk yeah i'm good yeah that's all from my side I guess that leaves me. Um, I've been working on most of the same stuff that Michelle's been working on, uh, helping her out and trying to figure out some of the stuff. Done a lot of work on the code that started as M17 code and it's being converted over to opulent voice or opulent voice, if you want, um, in order to test out our high bit rate codec scheme. That's progressing slower than we'd like as usual. Um, also looking at driving the encoder. And there's one fundamental thing that I'd like to understand that I don't really understand yet. And maybe reading of a Reese code is the best way to get the answer, but I'm gonna try asking instead. Um, as we send these, we're sending BB frames to the encoder, right? And the BB frames have a definite start and a definite end. They're not a stream like samples would be. So how does the encoder know where the edges of the BB frame are when I'm feeding it. Is there a, a block transfer operation that it's aware of or and that, that the, the driving code needs to be aware of or is there some other scheme for that? Uh, Anshul, do you have if, the answer to that? If I remember correctly, uh, there are no end markers, but um, in the metadata that that we passed before the BB frame, there is the size. And I think encoder relies on that size. Okay. How does the encoder find the beginning of the metadata? Hmm. Do you I mean, mean like the mod cods and stuff like that? When you say yeah. metadata, because we used to call metadata yeah. like the mod cod mod. and the frame size and stuff. Yeah, it, the 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 block actually uh, takes tears tears down the the header so it it decodes and looks at the pl header as if it was receiving it and derives the information from from that so it does it inside the block so yeah uh, paul if you if you think that a stream has started and it will read from the beginning of the stream and at the beginning there is a mod code data uh, so it will know when the next bb frame will start because it will know the size of the first block Okay, so right. the stream has to start cleanly for that to work. Yes. And nothing has to ever go wrong. I mean, uh, 
presumably yes for the basic approach, but I need to go again through the protocol to understand there should be some other way. Yeah. Does it maybe use the TLAST signal in the AXI stream? Yes, that's their TLAST symbol. Yeah, I hope so. That I was guess... my suspicion too. Yes. Um, yeah, maybe... So that makes it a block transfer and the blocks are the BB frames. Yeah. Yes. That would make sense. And that would be self-synchronizing. Yes. Yeah, we do send TLA symbol. Yeah. Is that just a, but is it like a stream buffer that you're just trying to keep full or is it BB frame by BB frame? Hmm. I have to look at the implementation. I don't remember at the top of my head, but yeah, I have the answer for that. I can get it, get it for you. Yeah, it sounds like we probably need to understand this better. I, I'll ask Ken to, to look at the code and we can always ask Swato and confirm. And, and I yeah. think Th Thomas probably has a, a good handle on this too. Um, yeah, yeah, I think if we want to make it resilient, that if the if it if the stream is screwed up in any way, that it can still work. Yeah, definitely. The, I assume this would be evident if I looked at every code because he's probably doing it the way it's intended to be done. Um, I glanced at that repo and it's full of so much Linuxy stuff that I couldn't even find the source code for the, the C program that does the actual work, assuming that that's what it is. Um, uh, I think so we I need to look at the RTL code rather than the C code because uh, once once a C code sends a PB frames, uh, a stream of PB frames, it's, it's the RTL code that will start with the process, with the processing of that PB frame. And uh, and then it will, it's, it's a pipelining based approach. So each pipeline, each uh, step in the pipeline will send the uh, beam frames to the next pipeline to attach some more headers. Uh, so yeah, uh, there we need to look at the implementation and when we are sending the T last and T beginning so that, uh, because, because it's going in a form of X stream, uh, that's how we designed RTL and how we are uh, designating beginning and end, um, we need to look at the RTL code to figure out. But yeah, definitely there is T, T last we sent after now that that I that I need to find whether it's at after every BB frame or at what frequency we send T last. Okay. One thing I'd yeah. I'd like to think about is whether we can afford to process every BB frame individually in the processor level, or if that's just too fast. Uh, I haven't really done the calculation to figure out what's likely to work, but if we're going to be running an operating system on the processor side, then latent latency is going to be an issue. Uh, can you come up again? Uh, processing of BB frames, what do you mean by that? Well, BB frames come by pretty fast. They're happening all yes. the time yes. and they're, um, and they're not very long in, in terms of milliseconds. Yeah. So if we're, if we have to do a processor operation to send each BB frame, and it has to be done within a narrow window, probably during mm -hmm. the previous BB frame. That may be uh, a lot to ask of the processor subsystem. Uh, yeah, uh, you mean we will be? You mean we will be doing DMAing uh, the BB frames to the encoder, and whether that will be fast enough? Yeah, the actual DMA will be plenty fast. It better be, or else nothing will work. But each DMA has to be at least kicked off, if not actually mm -hmm. programmed by the the software yes and for that we can have we can we can implement a fifo in the software uh, so that we always have the frames available uh but again yeah uh, that's one way of handling delay or some timing mismatch and yeah, that's what you, we do you could you could do a fifo with one bb frame being the element but you could also say, well, that's just too fast. We're going to have 10, 10 BB frames being a uh, sort of some kind of super frame that the software schedules. Uh, mm. I don't know. Yeah. But I have to look at the numbers and see what. Yes, the, yes, yes. What the issue? Is. Yes. Yeah. We might be at the point where we can answer that question. I my instinct is that we're we're good, but uh, we all know how instincts can fail. So. So I have two action items just to confirm that the T last signal is operating as a as a signal for for the framing 
within the encoder that it's communicating and using all of the options that it has available to it as a for AXI and AXI stream, which I think it does, but but we have we can have a couple of people look at that and and make sure that we know what we're doing so that we can feed it correctly. And then um, timing and performance is the two action items from that I'm hearing. So I've got them written down and we'll we'll do our best to answer the questions. Okay, any other comments or questions or reports? I don't think I said anything about the remote lab here, but there's nothing to say about the remote lab here. That's actually good. Uh, things have been things have been working. Um, I of course uh, usually find uh, the time that you have scheduled the uh, backup or parity check. It seems to be the the time that I uh, most often use it. So I I suspect that it does not matter what day of the week you pick for parity check that I will show up and try to do work, um, and that's fine. And uh, yeah, no, thank you everybody for, for tackling something that is ambitious and hard. And um, I think I'm definitely uh, proud of, of what we're, we're doing. We still have quite a ways to go, but it's, uh, it's coming along and some, some larger structure is emerging and we are going to get a chance to do things that most commercial systems don't get to, to experiment with uh, because we're not uh, driven as hard by trying to cram lots of subscribers into every every uh, hertz of bandwidth. So so we do have some some other things that we can experiment with and, and play with, and those things are going to happen uh, in the near future. So very excited about that. Yeah, if you need anything or you have a roadblock or a question or or just want to um, you know learn something, then uh, come to come to Slack or the email list and uh, and and speak up. Oh, and I think I have I have a couple of uh, reports from from Leonard. Uh, so so Leonard's day job prevents him from coming to this meeting, uh, but Leonard Degas is working on on getting the Pluto implementation up and running as a demo, and uh, that's coming along and and he's excited about that. Um, if you if you didn't have you haven't looked at his uh, RF model that he did in in Python, it's it's pretty neat and useful, and that's in the repo. And uh, and he he wanted to pass along his uh, his progress and say hello to everybody. All right, thank you everybody, and see you see you next week if not before, and uh, and on Slack. Thank you. Thank you. You bet. See you soon. Thank you. Just bye. Bye.